Hello, it's me again, Gareth Williams, specialist orthodontist, and I want to talk to you today about the upper impacted canine teeth. If you find these videos helpful, as always, please leave a comment, like, and subscribe, and ring the notification bell. It really does help me get this video out to as many patients as possible, even patients that aren't my own, because I think information on orthodontics and dentistry is something that's really lacking in the UK uh, on the whole, so hopefully this channel can help that. But anyway, thanks for your support. So starting with impacted canines. Impacted canines are quite a rare occurrence in the general populace, but a very common occurrence in my practice as a specialist orthodontist because everyone refers those cases to me. Impacted canines form or happen because the canine tooth, when it's developing, actually starts developing just under the eye here. This is why these teeth are called eye teeth. It's due to their path. And while all the other teeth start developing at this sort of level, what you find is this eye tooth is more likely as it tracks down to get crowded out by the other teeth which come into its space. And then you've got this canine which cannot come down into the space that it should have been appropriated. Now there's a few outcomes to that canine being impacted. It either comes through on the cheek side, so it can look a bit sort of Dracula type appearance. It can come through on the inside, the palate, right on the inside, or it can, and this is the worst case, come through in the line of the arch of the teeth. And what happens in that situation is that it can actually eat through the other teeth. Now that's a very high risk situation. And for that reason, impacted canines should be treated fairly promptly. Impacted canines are one of those types of cases that if the waiting list is significant, let's say over four to six months, that you might wish to consider private options for if it's doable and doesn't cause you financial hardship or stress. Impacted canines are treated in a few modalities. Option one for an impacted canine is to leave it where it is. If it's not bothering you, if it's not impacting on other teeth, you do have the option of leaving an impacted canine where it is. The risk of leaving an impacted canine is one, that it can fuse itself to the bone, a process we know as ankylosis, and that can make it very difficult to remove at a later stage. Two, it can undergo cystic change. So a cyst is sort of a fluid-filled sac that can form on the crown, so the top end of a tooth. And that can very rarely undergo a process known as squamous metaplasia, where that lining of the cyst can become cancerous or at least a tumour-like growth. That is extremely rare, but again, higher than having it removed. And of course, the big danger of leaving an impacted canine is that it eats away at other teeth, causing you to lose a number of healthy adult teeth. And that's when you're talking about needing dentures or bridges or implants. Option two for an impacted canine is the removal of the impacted canine. And that's a surgical procedure and generally done under a general anaesthetic, but not always. I've done a number of these procedures on patients who are also awake and just have a local anaesthetic. It depends on your constitution, your attitudes, your anxieties, that sort of thing. The benefits of that procedure are that you avoid the risks that I've detailed in option one. The procedure normally takes about 10 to 20 minutes and you will need some stitches. Where they are will depend on where the access to the impacted canine is. So the stitches will be on the uh, on the inside of your mouth always, but they might be on this this outer surface, just above the gum here, if you're getting a, a what we call a buccal access, or on the inside, if you need to get what we call palatal access to that impacted canine. Procedurally, the risks of removal of an impacted canine are the same whether you have local or general anaesthetic, and that's bleeding, bruising, swelling, slow healing, stitches that can be lost, sometimes numbness, which is most commonly temporary, but can sometimes go on to be permanent. And then you've got very specific risks of the removal of impacted canine, one of which is damage to the roots that are either sides, or the tooth might have already damaged that root, but we cannot see it on x-rays. Sometimes because of the nature of the overlap, it can be difficult to see damage that has already occurred until you are looking at those teeth in the operation. The third option for impacted canines is surgical exposure and bringing them down into the mouth. And that's often done by using a, a brace and then making space for that tooth, either with springs, coils, or anything like that, or removal of another tooth, which is already in the mouth, and making room for it that way to come down. The risks of that are uh, similar risks procedurally and operationally in terms of the anaesthetic choice and risks to adjacent roots and that sort of thing. And the benefits are that you get to keep a natural canine tooth in the mouth, which is generally considered to be aesthetically more pleasing. So a good smile should have a flat profile across the front four teeth, followed by 
what we call a canine framing. So we, we often think the canines frame the smile. It's not essential, other teeth can be masked to look like that, but if you're really looking for a very nice natural result, bringing a canine down is generally the best option. Disadvantage is uh, it's a long old slog sometimes, so to pull an eye tooth down from here to there can often mean that your treatment takes two years, three years, sometimes three and a half even, whereas a general orthodontic treatment we'd like to take a year to 18 months maximum. So these are very extended treatment plans. But for some patients who are motivated, keen, and want to go that route, it works very well. And I certainly have done a very high number of these. Okay, I hope that's helpful. Thank you for listening.